let's get ourselves organized here. Let's plug out here. Where are we? Other streams. Okay, get myself. view open so if anyone happens to already be watching what we can see here this is a um, some of the output from the uh, work in progress um, web browser web's not really the right word here because we it's http but it's not html um, i guess it's a web it's just not the web as we know it um, but the idea is that you can host files that are intended to be consumed by omega 65 on a regular web server uh, and then have them uh, displayed on the um, uh, the Mega 65 uh, in an interactive way. And so we'll, we'll do a bit of hacking on that for a little while tonight. Uh, let me get to the right. I just need to have a, a tab open here so I can see if you uh, chat or have anything to say to me. Because again, if anyone has any questions or anything as we go through, absolutely welcome to. Uh, uh, to pop that through, and it's good the internet is working at Unsight better for us tonight. Uh, I think we had a bit of a uh, problem with the ISP uh, when I was on the other day. So let me, in fact, get drag that one over, put that on the other screen where I can share that with you. Uh, right. Okay, so uh, test dot and oh, our window is a little bit too big here. This is one of my things this uh, streaming setup for whatever reason it um, letterboxes the reverse letterboxes really it enlarges and cuts off the top and bottom and sides of the window so I can't make it quite full screen so I can't just hit on the, uh, uh, the full screen button. Right, now I can see down the bottom there. So here we have a simple markdown file and this is what I'm going to use as the, the input to generate these files. Uh, for now we might get more sophisticated and as we go through you'll actually see that the potential for what you can do with this is uh, a little bit more sophisticated than just uh, doing markdown. Uh, so, but again, we have simple, this is totally normal markdown. We've got a, a hash there to mark a header. We've got a paragraph of text. We've got another paragraph. This time we've got some bold text uh, in there. Then we've got a couple of paragraphs here. This is two sentence paragraph, but there's no blank line between, so it should all get rendered out as a single uh, paragraph. Then we've got more than one blank line to test that they get uh, munched up correctly. Uh, and another paragraph of text. And so what we want to do is to display this on the Mega 65. Now we could make a parser on the Mega 65 side as a client. Uh, that would require a fair bit of code running on the client end. And at the moment, now there are three C compilers that are su that the Mega support the Mega 65. Uh, there is CC 65, which is the one that we're using, which has been around forever and a day. Uh, and it's great, except that it doesn't produce the most optimal code. Um, but it's super standard compliant and everything compared to the um, uh, to some other uh, potential options um, but yeah it just has this nuisance that the uh, uh, it produces big fat flabby code so another option would be to use um, Kixi uh, so Kixi also supports the Mega 65 but it doesn't support unions uh, which is a kind of structure in C so we can't use that at the moment, uh, which is really unfortunate because Kixi produces beautifully optimized code. Uh, his whole backend code generator is really oriented around producing very efficient code. It does this kind of quite clever way with these uh, this idea of fragments that it glues together and count cycles and uh, you know it, it's written by demo coders. Uh, so it, it really has a, a nice approach to uh, producing performant code that's quite small as well. But it doesn't cover the full gamut of uh, C uh, language compliance yet. Yet, uh, I have spoken to uh, to Jesper uh, about adding support for structs, uh, so that we're really cool when it comes out. 
Um, and the third one is actually that we're working with um, uh, Volker uh, on VBCC, which is his C compiler that targets a number of different interesting platforms. And we have a partially uh, working Mega 65 target of his C compiler as well. And that's another really nice one that is kind of, it's a little bit between the two, if you like. It's very C compliant. It's not as optimal uh, optimizing with the coded outputs, so or rather it does a different set of optimizations on the code. Uh, it's a bit more of a traditional optimizing C compiler. Uh, but that's also at the moment uh, not ready to use. So we, we're stuck with CC65. And the problem with that is, is that it produces big fat code uh, and it doesn't support Mega 65 mode per se. Uh, so all the code has to fit uh, in a single 64K uh, memory space. And actually we're using kind of, we're actually running this code out of C64 mode for the moment. So that means that we're kind of limited to about 38K of code uh, maybe we can do 46 uh, or 50 if we bank out the basic ROM. Uh, we might yet have to do that. We might even have to do that tonight. We'll see how we go. Uh, but we, we, we're quite limited in the code size. And the problem we have, of course, is that uh, a TCP IP stack, because this is actually an internet connected program, it's actually using the, uh, the Ethernet adapter. Where are we? Uh, on the Mega 65. So we've got the Ethernet cable uh, here that goes. Uh, across and around uh, into a switch and uh, from there <laughs> actually it goes over one of those uh, ethernet over power adapters which are not that great uh, but I haven't yet actually come up with a better wiring solution here into the office so you'll actually see we get a bit of packet loss and kind of weird things and I think it's interacting with um, uh, WIP which is the uh, tiny TCP IP stack that we've ported to the Mega 65 in some strange ways uh, that causes odd delays but by and large it's working and we'll, we'll refine some of that performance as we go along. Uh, you see it's just a little bit annoying at the moment but it's at the same time it still works and this is what we used for doing the BBS client uh, for the Mega 65 uh, a little while back as well. And we might even uh, we'll revisit that uh, in time as well to uh, give that support so you can actually type in the host name and port numbers for the BBSs. So because of all of that uh, we have to make our code small. So that means that the browser needs to be as simple as possible with the page rendering. So if we try to do HTTP, sorry, HTML parsing or something like that, we're going to end up with quite a lot of code or we're going to have to hand code it in assembly or do some other kind of uh, heavy optimizing work, which I don't really have the time for at the moment. Uh, but what also occurred to me is that we have a, an advantage that we didn't have back in the day. Well, actually we have a couple of advantages, right? So um, over normal HTML. Um, so HTML purposely separates the form uh, and the semantics and uh, you know, the display kind of pieces so that it would be portable. But for Mega 65 targeted stuff, we you know, the advantage of having something like a C64 class machine is that all the machines have the same specification. They all have the same memory layout we can actually really optimize things and say, well, why don't we just use that together with the fast networks we have in comparison to back in the 80s and make something that can actually just <laughs> transfer, if you like, a memory image of what needs to go in chip RAM to display the page. So in fact, we don't have any rendering on the client side. We just go and display uh, this stuff. So that's actually what we're doing. Uh, and it turns out to be a, a beautifully simple way to do it. The, if you like, the complicated rendering happens on the generation side. We could do it, make a tool for the Mega 65 that will let you generate these. Uh, you know, we're calling them um, H65 files, uh, so hypertext 65. Uh, you could generate those natively on a Mega 65 in the future. There's no reason why we couldn't compile the um, the tool to do that. Uh, but what it does. Uh, is it produces exactly this, an, a uh, chip memory image of what's needed to display the page. And then it basically saves that out with some kind of uh, chunk markers and things on there, which uh, we'll go through in a little bit as well. And you know that's what then lets us display something uh, like this. Uh, so you know, <laughs> the parsing is gobsmackingly simple and just works and the nice thing is that whilst at the moment the tool only supports as you can see it's kind of you know displaying markdown using a fixed width font we can totally go to proportional width text as we did in megawatt 
uh, and that can all be computed on the um, uh, the uh, the server side, uh, pre-computed in fact. Uh, but we can also display inline images because we just include in the file the 8x8 graphics tiles for full color mode or for nibble color mode. Uh, and we, we're actually including the screen RAM and the color RAM in uh, the page. So uh, it's, yeah, it, it's super simple. Now, as I'm yakking away there and all this, it's great to see this. So three folks uh, are now watching, so welcome along. I'm just gonna have a look, because I've got a funny feeling that the display of that doesn't actually let me see any chat from you fine folks if you are trying to say anything to me. Uh, maybe actually if, if one of you could actually just type something in the chat that would be great so that I can actually see uh, if that comes up in the window that I'm uh, looking at here. So yeah, someone, someone just type something in. I, I, I don't mind what you want to type in. Uh, or maybe even type something in that you'd like to see me put into the markdown uh, and I'll re-render the, uh, uh, the markdown and reload that onto the, uh, the Mega 65 in a moment there. Or maybe you're, uh, you're all at work and can't type. Uh, and, and that's fine too. So, while we wait for that, let's have a look then again uh, in our editor. So MD to H65.C. So this is in the Mega65 Tools repository under Source Tools PNG Prepare. Uh, the reason it's in the PNG Prepare directory is that it does actually have support for the uh, the PNG images ready for doing the inline uh, images. We might even actually be able to get to that point tonight. That would be pretty cool if I can uh, do that. Otherwise, we'll, we'll do that in due course. Um, but let's have a look at how this thing works. So starting in the uh, the main function uh, we're clearing we, we set up a, a dummy lot of color RAM as you can show you at the top here. Where is it? okay so the, this tile set structure in RGB colors this is for doing the PNG handling this is just pulled in directly from uh, from that palette set up yep so we, and this is setting up the initial C64 palette because in fact when we load the page we also load the entire palette uh, at the same time as well so everything that you as I said the, the chip RAM setup is in the, um, uh, the H65 file including also uh, a bunch of VIC4 register values that can be included in there uh, so let's jump down past that to the uh, hypertext part of things so we're saying okay the Mega 65 has 32k of color RAM at most um, some models will probably get 64K, um, as we originally had in the design. We had to cut it back because we are running out of FPGA space. And we have here things like what color we're going to use for the text by default. The saved color, this is because we do bold and headings. Uh, again, if we have a look at this, uh, we're actually using different colors as well as actually the underlying VIC3 attribute uh, in there. Uh, so we keep track of the attributes, we keep track of the indent, we're not using it yet, but this will be for things like uh, having indent uh, you know, uh, lists, whether they're numbered uh, or not numbered. Um, and ooh, welcome along uh, to whoever has just dropped in as well. Um, and then we've got our image of what the screen RAM and color RAM would need to be to display things and how much we've used, how many lines we've had, and whether we're currently in a paragraph or whether we've kind of omitted the last paragraph that we're in. Uh, and then, uh, again, if we come down to the main function, we read, set up an input file and output file. This is pretty boring. Uh, allow for 128K of tiles that will go in bank four and bank five. Uh, if we have images or when we get to the point of having images, I really actually I'm really keen to, to get images in because I think it's going to be uh, pretty cool to be able to show that. Um, and I'll have to think about how I can set that up so that we can make the text flow around the images nicely because that would be uh, good to do. So uh, we read the markdown file in line by line and then for each line 
uh, we basically look to see whether it is something special. So if it starts with uh, a uh, hash symbol, then it's a, a heading marker. So we want to set the color to one. We set the attributes to 80 hex. So this enables the underline VIC3 attribute. And then we want to emit the rest of the text. So from offset two in the line, so we skip the hash at the beginning of the line in offset zero. And there should be a space after that. We assume that there is, and then we, uh, we emit that. Uh, from there and then as soon as we've output the heading hey Amok welcome along and good you, you've answered my question implicitly here which is that I can see messages in the chat window in that tab so I can that's good so uh, your greeting has served a, a dual purpose so um, that's going to let us set the way that we render uh, the headers uh, differently uh, in this uh, and then we're also looking to see if we have a blank line if we have a blank line that's our marker for an end of a paragraph so then we want to omit any paragraph that's currently uh, you know, half done and otherwise we're just doing normal text and so if it's normal text if the previous one was a heading we want to cancel any attributes that were uh, that were going there uh, and so that will go through and that will populate out uh, the screen RAM and the color RAM. So if we have a look at the emit text, so it tries to tokenize it into words and it checks to see, so if we're emitting text and it wasn't at the beginning of the line that we're currently outputting. So again, if we have a look on the uh, the rendered version of this, on so we've got the A header heading, then we've got some plain text, another paragraph, uh, and then the next paragraph is, here is a paragraph that's quite a bit longer and should require wrapping around blah 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 and it has two sentences in it that are being flowed together into one paragraph and if I go back here to test.md which is the input we can see they're actually in separate lines so the purpose of that check if the x is greater than the indent uh, that we're flowing text to at the moment that we've already written something so we need to put a space after it uh, because otherwise what would happen is that we would have the full stop and then we would have this would begin immediately after the full stop with no space so it would look like this instead of like this uh, in fact that's what it was doing earlier until i realized that i needed to do that hey and welcome along to a, another couple of folks as well um, great to have you along so uh, that's what we do at the beginning and of course if we have any attributes running with that space we need to make sure that we apply those attributes so we need to write that out to the color ram and that was actually important because until I had that, uh, if we have a look up uh, at the, okay, which way do I need to poke? <laughs> at, the, at the top of the screen, um, yeah, like <laughs> under my head, uh, we had the uh, A header. And so without that, uh, we don't get the underline under that space between A and header and it, it just looked a bit stupid. Uh, so that was the purpose of needing to put that in and obviously if we go past the right edge of the screen then we actually need to add one uh, to the line number and we need to uh, set the x back to the indent value uh, so that's kind of our, our, our tab stop because uh, i will in time support uh, unordered and ordered lists uh, in here so we need to actually have a um, uh, an indent position for that. And we might even have them nested and things. Again, we can do this on the server side. None of this adds complexity to the Mega 65 viewing side. Uh, and in fact, you could actually even, this kind of approach that we're doing, obviously on the Mega 65, we have uh, a bunch of um, extra kind of uh, features on the Vic 4 that we can do really cool stuff with. But we could do the same approach actually to make a simple web page like format for the C64. Uh, and again, it would be, you know, that the code size would be tiny, so you could actually have most of memory actually for the page, uh, which is kind of a, a nice advantage. Of course, the Mega 65 having a, a few extra banks of RAM, I've got an itch on the middle of my back. I need to get a, a back scratcher. I'm getting old. Um, that, uh, yeah, so the, the same idea could be used on a, a C64 or even on, on, on other 8-bit machines to make uh, a quite nice uh, web kind of interface for custom content. 
or indeed you could make a web server that actually lets you request pages and it, it, and it takes the HTML, turns it into Markdown and then feeds the Markdown to, uh, to the Markdown converter uh, and then pipes it out uh, to the 8-bit um, uh, the, the machine. Um, so it'd be totally doable as well. So anyway, but back to how the, uh, the conversion is working then. So we tokenize it, which is basically you know, using spaces and tabs and the end of lines as uh, boundaries. And we mark off the ends of the words and then we try and omit a word. Um, possibly if you're creating a MUD. Yeah, potentially. Um, it would be, so for a, a multi-user dungeon, it's probably gonna be, a, you'd use a different approach, although you could still use the same approach. Um, and you just, it would be quite funny, you'd have games for the 8-bit machine that use more bandwidth than some of the games on uh, on higher end things do. Uh, it depends on, you know, I think for a MUD, to have a real 8-bit view, you probably want to do a lot of local processing and rendering. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's certainly uh, an option for doing it. Uh, so, and then of course at the end, where are we? Oh yeah, so what if we output a word if we uh, we need to put a space after it, again, so that the words don't get all glued together. Uh, so again, if we, on our test.md, I haven't actually put that in there, we might actually, so I need to, if we put lots of spaces in here between two words, it should get ignored. So we'll, we'll do a test with that in a moment. Um, so yeah, tokenizing and putting a single space after each one, and then of course at the end of a line, uh, we need to output a um, uh, any word that's kind of batched up in there. So again, that gets us you know, this kind of uh, display. So in fact, now that I've saved that MD file, let me I need to regenerate the MD file, and then I need to push it back to the Mega 65. So, reboot away. And as I was saying earlier, uh, we get the occasional funny thing with the, the network still. And uh, how much of it is caused by the um, Ethernet over power adapter? And how much is caused by other things? I'm not sure. Ah, so it's interesting. So, we can see that adding all of those extra spaces in, it didn't get consumed. So that's really interesting. Um, let's have a look at the logic and try and work out why that is. I do have a bit of an idea why that might be. Because we're looking for a space or a tab, but we actually then don't skip over any further ones. So we're kind of emitting a zero length word every time when we do this. So if word len is non-zero, we're emitting a word. Uh, but we're not actually only doing the space after it. So I reckon that's probably going to fix it. So the DHCP detection should be faster as well, right? Well, <laughs> okay, we've got rid of all of the spaces. That's probably not what we want. Um, so let's come back and... So probably really it was if last was word... Um, and how's the, uh, hopefully you're getting radio parallax there in the background uh, as well. Is that coming through okay in a decent volume level? Ah, I see why, because yeah, we zero out the, the word length um, after we emit a word. Yes, okay, so I think that, oops. Int last was word. Let's try that and see if that doesn't fix the problem.
Uh, okay, so Tegra is asking, uh, why am I using the, the asterisks rather than HTML? Um, basically, it's just easier to write a markdown parser than it is an HTML parser. But, the, <coughs> pardon me, there's nothing stopping us changing this server-side stuff to support full HTML. Um, or as, as full as you want to get and basically to render it onto a Mega65 uh, you know, screen. Because that's what we're basically doing, is server-side rendering of, uh, of, of you know, text and image to show on the Mega65. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just lazy and can't be bothered writing a HTML parser. Uh, and I think it's probably for the kind of complexity of the pages we want, that Markdown's probably just as easy. And there are HTML to Markdown converters. So, um, okay, but we're, we're back where we started, in that we are not um, filtering out The spaces, rather getting none of them or all of them. If last was word, so if last was word is non-zero, then we output the space. Okay, that's all fine. Um, if so if we hit a space, ah yes again, because it's any space. Even if we haven't had a word in between. So we need to set last was word to one only when we actually really see a word. I think this will get it now. Hey Anton, welcome along. See how we go. So I've also actually refactored a pile of this code out for doing the H the um, socket connections and things, so it's easier when we want to chain pages. But cool, so that's fixed it now, right? Uh, so we had a bunch of spaces uh, between should and be, and we, we still do in the markdown file, and we're correctly uh, pulling those out. So you know we've got some basic formatting here that uh, you know uh, that's quite reasonable you know it, it, it's enough for now anyway uh, we will want to add support for links uh, in the fullness of time um, and not even that far away in the fullness of time but let's actually start by just adding support so that we can have um, more text and fits on one screen and maybe add some mouse support uh, and keyboard and joystick support so that we can actually scroll through that because I have here as well um, so this I've been waiting on for ages to arrive. I've got my mouse to um, USB to DB9 adapter and I should have a, uh, a dodgy old PC mouse somewhere because my uh, 1351, I, I need to change the resistor in it again. The, the opto sensors in them get a uh, funny bias over time. Uh, and so it won't move left, I think it is. It goes up, down, fine, and it goes right. Uh, but it really doesn't want to go left. So, um, we might even actually plug the, uh, the, the mouse to in now. And that would be cool to, uh, uh, to add support for that. Ooh, it's flashing all fun. You probably actually can't see that. Yeah, but it's flashing. You can see it off the the edge here is flashing fun colours at us, presumably because it's going, can't feel my mouse. No. That's right, you can sit there and, uh, and blink at us for a while. So, let's get some more text in there, enough to overfill the screen. So the other thing, of course, that's implicit here is uh, switching the, um, the VIX-3 into 80 column mode and 50 row mode. So we're actually getting uh, 4,000 characters on the screen at once, which is kind of cool. And the whole program, and so again, this is the, uh, the tricky bit for us in this. We need to keep an eye on how big this program is. So it's currently um, 34,348 bytes long, the complete TCP IP stack, and the page fetcher renderer. So let's have a look actually at So this is called fetch.c. I'll give it a, a, a better name at some point. 
let's have a look at how this works. Okay, so in our main function, so we're setting the, this is the, the, uh, the LAN uh, address from my laptop where I'm running the web server on for testing. Port 8000, because I'm not running it as root. Uh, so we start by uh, you know, randomizing and enabling Mega 65 IO and enabling 40 megahertz mode, the kind of usual uh, boilerplate stuff that you uh, often want to have uh, in this kind of thing. Uh, in any Mega 65 thing, then prepare network. So let's have a look at prepare network. So this does the DHCP and WIP kind of setup. So you know, we have that uh, black screen with the green text and uh, we show what our MAC address is. You can see if you have anything kind of crazy there. And then we do the DHCP auto configuration. And then we just, you know, it reports what it is. And that's that, and falls back. And then we have a nice simple function here, fetch page. Uh, that actually lets us fetch one of these pages and actually then displays it. Uh, so we can put the host name, the port, and the path. So this is kind of nice and uh, super easy uh, to work with. And if the error uh, returned from that is the done signal, saying that it actually got the complete page, then we do some video mode setup so that we can actually show the, um, uh, the page. Uh, so we let the page provide values for DO31 so that we can choose you know, V400 and H640 and that kind of thing. Uh, notably, the pages don't have anything executable in them. They're purely display and in time uh, will be hyperlink uh, kind of information. Uh, then we enable 16-bit uh, text mode, uh, and or rather we enabled 40 megahertz mode, uh, which is what this bit is, uh, bit six. And then if the page wants 16-bit text mode, which is what you normally want to do if you want to be able to have graphics and uh, do, because um, you can do raster rewrite buffer and uh, all sorts of crazy stuff here uh, as well. Uh, we set that we set the number of bytes per line so here it's uh, for 80 um, times 2 bytes because we're doing 16-bit text mode and here actually so we, we're currently assuming that it's 16-bit text mode we might need to uh, to fiddle that later uh, set the high byte for that to zero we set the screen address um, to oops uh, in bank one so we skip the 8k that has the c65 dos so that we can still use a DOS if we want to potentially uh, then we set the color RAM to start uh, 8 kilobytes into the color RAM for the screen so this gives us um, 24k of color RAM that we can use for this it keeps the first 8k free so that we can still use the regular c64 mode screen and actually that's where we're going to write out debug information about the page loading and I'll actually have a hotkey set up in the program in time so that you can basically see uh, that second screen so to speak um, and 24k is also what we have between um, 1 2000 and 1 7 FFF in bank 1 and then from 1 8 uh, thousand to you know about 1 F thousand I'll actually keep that reserved for um, hypertext mapping information so that if you click anywhere uh, it'll be super fast and easy to go okay I clicked on offset blah in the um, uh, the screen memory, and you know does that correspond to a link? Uh, and there'll be these kind of you know ranges that will say yes, from this range to this range on uh, through the screen memory, that corresponds to link number three. And then there'll be a list of these links and go okay, link number three is this URL text, uh, and so that we can display the page from there. So we'll actually have really nice uh, hypertext linking with irregular shapes and all that kind of thing because it will be done on the server. Um, and the Mega 65 will have a super easy job to display it. So it'll be, uh, yeah, super nice and responsive. Uh, really only depend on the network speed to load the pages. Okay, so that's the color RAM and we allow setting of the char set. So this is important, What you, it's not obvious from what I displayed here. Uh, and so actually I meant to, to test this before, so we can do it now. If I go back to, uh, let's test.md. 
Right, we'll get rid of our silly spaces that we had in there really just to, well, we'll leave a few in just to test it. Now we'll put another paragraph. Here are some characters that are hard to type on a C64. A curly bracket. And that, that, and that, and even to turn. Oops. Uh, I need to switch my keyboard layout to get to so and which other ones because we actually so the the front printing if you haven't seen it already the front printing on the mega 65 keyboard you've got all the the petsky symbols you used to if you look under the square brackets, we actually have a little bit hard to see that they're curly brackets, but they're curly brackets. We've got ah tilde. That was the other one I was trying to remember. Um, pipe and backslash, uh, and back on the left arrow key we have the um, uh, the the back tick. It's a little bit hard to where the camera's mounted. I can't move it across further on here to see. And so you can get these keys by doing mega and the uh, you know and whichever key uh, to get those in software that supports it. But of course, the, the character set has to also support it. And so our markdown to Mega 65 converter loads an ASCII font into the chip RAM as part of the page. Uh, so you can have custom fonts in every page and everything and make it look really kind of cool. And you know, this, and it can be a Petsky font, it can be an ASCII font, who, who cares? You can have whatever you want and make it look really, really nice. Uh, so in, if I compile this now and load it up, we should actually, yeah, I can do it on that one we've got there, can't I? So you can actually see the commands that I'm running. That would be good to do. So that produces the, uh, the test.h65 file. I'll just show you what they look like inside. It is a really, really, really simple file format, as I said. So there's H65FF is the header. Then there is a version number uh, for what version of H65. And then we have some of those bytes setting up the, you know, the, uh, the VIC-4 uh, registers. The header allows up to 128 bytes for different things. And then we have the address of the first block that it wants to load. So this is, so it's in little Indian order so it's address FFD3100 that's the start of the red palette uh, and our length is 300 hex that's the length of the red green and blue palettes and then we literally have palette information following for 300 bytes and then following that we have the next chunk so this is the address so it's 1 2000 hex so that's the screen memory and it's eight DA bytes long. And we can see here is the screen memory all formatted up. You can see there's some of the, the text. And again, it's two bytes per character because we're using 16 bit text mode. And then we have the next block, which starts here. And again, it's just literally just these chunks. There's eight byte header and then there is data. Uh, so it's, it's pretty compact as well. We could do run length encoding or something on the files. We'll worry about that in a future version. Um, but I think actually with the network speeds, we just don't need to. Uh, and again, it keeps the code beautifully simple and small. Uh, and again, so this chunk will be 8DA bytes long. And so here is the color RAM. And so here we can see, remember at byte 80, that's the attribute byte for underline and one is white. So this is the white underline color for that header. If we have a look at the header. So that, you know, the, the top part of the header, where it says, you know, a header, um, it's the color RAM for exactly that. Uh, and then if we go through, I think that's, what have we got there? Ah, so this is the font, right? So here's the header for the font. The font gets put at F1000, so under the kernel, because we don't, we don't need the CPU to see it. Um, and it's 800 bytes long, two kilobytes long, because it's how long the character set is. And then we just have the character data following. 
So the, the font is also included uh, in there. So anyway, so that builds that. Uh, and then if we go to my VIP directory, So again, I'm just doing this from the command line. I could make a script that does both of these things. but So when I run that, it's actually connecting to the Mega 65 and causing it to be run. So hopefully we'll see those symbols and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Look at that, so we've got these ASCII symbols showing up. So that's that's super nice. So we can just chuck text in there uh, on, a, uh, on Linux box or Windows or whatever, and be able to make that display in this kind of nice way. Uh, and it's all, whoops, uh, fixed width at the moment, but that's fine. And so if we look at that command, so I delete the you know, compiled version of the program that I want to uh, to build, then I make it again, that double ampersand, so the command will abort at this point if the compilation failed. Uh, we use M65 to reset, switch to C64 mode and run fetch-unpack.prg. The makefile actually produces a, um, an XMized binary, but I can't be bothered waiting for it to unpack all the time at the moment uh, while I'm testing. Uh, so if that works, then in the Mega65 tools directory, we run a simple web server, uh, just using Python to do a simple web server in port 8000 so that we can actually serve that file uh, in a nice way. And so again, if I I'll run that while we're watching the Mega65, and so yeah, it's compiling it, it's resetting the Mega 65, it's then going to load the program, it runs it, the program then begins to run, and does everything it needs to, and voila, uh, it's there. And we can see, you know, we've had a little bit of sort of fast loading effect uh, with that. VIP, uh, we probably actually will modify it to support more than one packet in trans uh, transit. Uh, at the moment, to be really super memory efficient, it doesn't actually do any buffering. And so it advertises a window size of one packet. So while it, the file is coming over the LAN, that's not too bad. But if you've got round trip delays from Australia to uh, Germany, for example, 320 odd milliseconds, that's gonna be pretty miserable transfer speeds. Uh, Cause you're only gonna get you know, a couple of packets a second uh, under fair weather conditions. So yeah, uh, that's a, a, a little bit annoying. Cool, so. We've got ASCII characters in there, so let's go back and let's add enough text so that we actually fill uh, the screen up. So let's, just because we can, right? Um, let's actually use some text out of the Mega 65 user guide. Um, appendix. Markdown, so we'll do markdown if I this. Um, I'll leave the image things in there for the moment. Well, it doesn't really matter. We're just wanting enough stuff to fill up the screen for a bit, here, right? So let's. bigger than it used to be.
bit longer to load because it's got more packets in this longer file. Cool. Look at that. And so that's comfortably filling the, um, the page. The um, wrapping is working fine, the, the word boundaries and things. And okay, yeah, we, we don't support the, uh, uh, the graphics display yet. That's totally fine. But we have more than a page worth of text on there. So what I might do next is actually add cursor key support so that when we're displaying the page, we can actually scroll up and down. So we want to know how many lines are in the, um, the thing so that we don't scroll past the bottom of it, which we get, right? Because we have line count, we read in a variable. So here is our, we fetched the page, we displayed the page. So we can, in our while loop, we can have if peak D610, so he's going to do, use the hyper accelerated keyboard reading. Uh, so down is 11, I think, isn't it? So what we want to do, um, scroll down eight pixels. Read the key. And then we'll scroll up. If we do it that way, so let's make these functions to do the scroll. Or this function rather. Void scroll down int distance. Yeah. So the, what we're going to do with this function, we're going to use it for both scrolling up and down. The distance is going to be pixels. So eventually we want to support smooth scrolling, and because I want it so that with the mouse, you can move the mouse up and down. It just looks really, really nice. But initially we'll do line by line. Um, so what we want to do is we want to use the distance to modify the uh, screen position that we uh, display. So we're simply just going to change the base address for the uh, Vic4 to get its screen memory and its color memory. We actually don't have to copy anything around. We just tell the Vic4 which bit of the screen we want it to display. Um, again, super, super, super efficient. Uh, so we can, because um, we know, we're probably actually gonna have to keep track in fact actually of um, unsigned, short because the screen is only 24k long right um, so screen address offset we started at zero screen address offset plus equals plus oh. the, oh, the keyboard is back in confusing myself here Yes. I'm just switching between English and German keyboards. I confuse myself sometimes. Um, so the screen offset needs to be added on to distance times line width times two. So if we're going down the screen, um, we're going to add on to the um, screen base address by you know, two bytes per character that are across on a, a row uh, for each line. And then we'll just do some sanity check, right? So if screen address offset uh, what she, two, what we're gonna do, we're gonna do this as a long, so it's a 32-bit number. 
because we don't have to fiddle with it often so the computational cost is going to be quite small but this is just going to make sure we don't have any um, wrap around when we go up and down so screen offset address we actually want to make it signed because then we can say if it's gone less than zero we can say screen address off set is equal to zero and if screen address offset is greater than screen address offset max screen address offset equals screen address offset max so we're going to clamp how far we move around the um, uh, the screen with this Uh, right, okay, so just having a look at the, the chat window here. So is this um, a kind of preparation for the Mega 65 to browse the internet in general and to access the file host as well? Yes, this is exactly what we want to be able to support this kind of thing. Um, yes, so in, in actual fact, so on the file host, um, you only need HTTP. So I've purposely made this work with HTTP. So all we have to do is to have the, the files in the right format or to make a CGI that talks H65. Uh, so yeah, it's going to give us really fun potential to uh, uh, to do some great things here. Um, I'm just going to move this. I had this because I was kind of talking through what I was doing with some of the, uh, the blog posts and stuff before, but it's getting in the way over there now. I'm trying to look at this different stuff. Okay. So, that means that we also need to have screen address offset max. And we'll set that when we fetch the page. So we might in fact define these up here. So when we fetch the page, we know the length of the page, so we need we know the number of lines because we read that out in the part of here, right? So line count gives us the number of lines. So okay, if line count is greater than 50, so only if there's more than one screen's worth, if there's less than a screen's worth, we don't want to allow scrolling, but there's more than a Enough. We have um, screen offset max is equal to line width times two times line count minus fifty. So the number of excess lines beyond the fifty that fit on the screen. Um, that's how far we'll allow the scrolling to go down. So, the, well, it's, so we, we did the scrolling, <laughs> we did the calculation, we haven't actually set it right. Uh, so now what we want to do is to calculate the screen, to apply that screen offset um, onto the thing. So we want to poke OXD, so this is the low byte of the screen, so this is set screen offset address. Screen address offset. And the high by because it's relative to um, 01 2000. So we need to set the higher bytes for this. So that should set the screen offset address. And 
and then we need to set the screen, uh, sorry, the color RAM, right? So that's D064 and D065. Where was it? Scroll down here, I guess. So we only have two bytes of that. D065, D064. So that should let us, in theory, scroll using the cursor keys already. Very exciting how it works. Ooh, something is working. Ooh, something is working badly. <laughs> yeah, is the program still running? Or is it crashed? Still looking for the keyboard there by the look of things. And it's set. Whoa, oh, that's funky. Right, so that's got it back to normal. So, we've clearly not clamped our screen offset address correctly. So let's have a look at the, the code for that. So if screen offset, address offset rather is less than zero, then make it equal to zero. So that, that can't be a problem. Um, screen address offset can't be more than screen address offset max. So I'm suspicious that screen address offset max our problem. So let's So I'm going to write that to a known location in memory because I don't have a de good debugger that will let me show this yet and we'll get set up with challenge debugger at some point so it will be really good for this kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to copy from So copy four bytes long from that variable because it's 32 variable, so it's four bytes long to address E1000 where we're not writing anything else. And let's see what appears in E1000 so we can see what's going on. Okay, so that's displaying there. But actually we can do it with this, right? So it thinks the maximum screen offset can be E060 bytes in a memory area that's only 6,000 bytes long in hex. So clearly we are <coughs> doing something horrible with that calculation. Um, and what was happening when we were actually doing the scrolling, right? So if I press it once, what we're expecting is that the word A header should disappear and then we'll have the blank line with uh, some plain text directly below it. But we don't get that. It's actually jumping down quite a lot. <coughs> uh. <coughs> <coughs> uh. Ah. Sorry about that. So we can actually see here that the address, the screen address ends up being, and again you have to read um, left to right with the bytes there, right? Um, in reverse order. So it's at one, two, five, zero, zero. Um, so it's jumped forward over a kilobyte when I've just gone to scroll down once. 
Uh, so that's clearly wrong. Um, let's try and see what we can see about that. Um, now, let's have a look here in the, the chat. So, Tego saying, I think browsing the internet would be too much, passing out the HTML. Yep, but direct download of PRG files and things. Yep, absolutely, and BBSs uh, with home pages. Absolutely. But in actual fact, we could have lists and things uh, in there as well. I think we can get a nice happy in between that actually uh, is quite uh, capable without it having to be, you know, a full HTML, CSS engine with JavaScript, right? There, I think there is a, a happy uh, in between. And, and thank you both for the uh, uh, the commiserations on the sneeze. So let's. Um, have a look back at the source. So screen address. Well, more, let's look at the scrolling because scrolling once shouldn't. Ah, yes, it's gone eight lines, right? Because remember, I've got this distance in what well, that I want in pixels. So what I want, in fact, to do is that because and so we're ignoring the bottom order bits and we will um, add the smooth scrolling in uh, after but let's just get the, the course scrolling so that should work for that now why it wasn't clamping at the end that's a mystery and we'll, we'll deal with that separately um, but let's ah good if I didn't have clutch thumbs here, right? Okay, so now hopefully, look at that, it's scrolling one line at a time, and we've got something bad happening with the colours down the bottom. It's fine, we'll worry about that in due course. So it's letting us go to the end, that's good. Ah, but when I go up, this is the problem. I'm putting minus eight in. I reckon I need to qualify that minus eight. Or rather, I need to make sure that that is getting um, typecast. Yeah, see, because that's going to be um, handled as an int, not a long. So let's just make the function take it as a long, and I reckon that might, in and of itself, be enough. Yep, so I can't go back up. You know, I'm trying to go back up, and it, it won't. Now I can come down. Ooh, that's interesting because it's a different amount of black. So let me scroll down. Much too much. But we'll come back up again after. At the moment it's being a little bit slow just because of the way we're reading the keyboard and things um, but in principle there's no copying happening here it's just purely uh, moving the, uh, the the points on the screen around um, I really am curious as to where that funny spot is ending up in the color and how that's getting in there that's quite a mystery because everything else looks fine Ooh, be nice. Ooh, keep an eye on it. Um, but that's nice. We have scrolling. So let's have a look at adding some mouse support for that. So I need to try and find what I should have um, somewhere around here at my desk a chicken cheery. 
Yep. Now, I believe the mouse should be set up for Mega 65 um, already because the uh, the guy who makes them uh, has been kind of watching the project, and so I think some of that is already supplied to other folks are uh, suitable. So this is just an absolutely shockingly dull um, Dell mouse. Uh, probably costs less to make than a chocolate bar. Okay, so plug the mouse in, and we seem to have happy kind of lights showing on that now. So let's And it thinks it's an Atari ST mouse. Right, okay, so we will need to do the, uh, the setup uh, on here for, uh, for that. It's quite interesting actually that it worked like that. So let's have a look, because there is a way to set this up, isn't there? Mouse to configure. So I think I need a memory stick in my collection. You can stick in there and then it puts a magic file on there that you can then modify with the, uh, the correct config. So that means I need a going got one that's in the printer Somewhere it tells us how to configure it, but I, as I say, I'm pretty sure what I need to do is to stick a memory stick into it. Um, so I'm just going to grab one, be back in a second. Assume that that's been in long enough. Yep, there's a master directory on there. There's a master.ini file. Ah! <laughs> 
<laughs> my Linux machine is trying to run wine to modify the I and I, but we can. Okay, so let's come down and find. Right, so we want it to be mode two. And then we need so mode. Needs to be a mouse. set everything right. I'm pretty sure I have. We've set it to be a mouse and which mode of mouse. So mode is mouse. Lock to mouse mode only. Correct. No, no, no we don't care about the auto fire. We don't care about the heartbeat. Mouse emulation is 1351. Okay, so let's, set, let's just set the gain for the mouse speed. That's pretty good. I think the rest of it's probably. Fine. Open physical mouse buttons. Swing seat. I wonder why that is. I wonder whether it's actually a problem with the Mega 65 because we've tried very hard to emulate the uh, the pot behaviour uh, on the Mega 65 so that uh, real 1351 mice work. Anyway, I think well, we're at the end anyway, right? So that's that fine. You mount media. Device busy. Oh, because I opened a file. Let's try that again. What's got it? Oh. Because that editor is open, right? Right. Now we should be good. So I'll chuck that back into the master. Uh, do I already have the update to the thing? Yeah, I don't have the listen thing here. That's quite annoying. I can't find a way that I can get that. Um, so this master is new enough. I'm believing it should work fine. I'll try it, and if it doesn't, then uh, I'll chuck the uh, uh, chuck that on. Okay. So we have blinking lights again. Plugging the mouse back in again. Let's see. straight away so yep that's looking good cool 
So we have that. So I'm going to put this memory stick back in the printer. Otherwise, my wife will kill me if she goes to print something and can't find it. accidentally pressing strange buttons okay so um, okay right yes you've, you've put a, an updated INI file on the uh, uh, the file host that just has the correct settings in it cool excellent excellent yeah indeed happy wife happy life absolutely absolutely I wish I was better at maintaining that state of affairs but that's all right um, so let's go back to our code then. So we already have the keyboard working for up and down. Um, now let's actually get the mouse working. So we want a sprite for the mouse, our uh, mouse pointer. Um, enable sprite one as mouse pointer. I'm hopeless at remembering the VIC2 registers. It's one 5 isn't it? Trying to set the mouse up kind of in the middle of the screen somewhere is uh, what I'm going to aim to do here. Now, because we are doing the Um, this, uh, the, our screen setup we're doing with hot rigs turned on we haven't turned them off um, and we're setting the address directly using the VIC4 registers yeah, then the um, uh, the sprite data uh, the sprite pointers rather will still be coming from the usual spot so if we um, oops, set 7f Eight to one. The, yeah, the sprite's changing, right? So we can set the sprite, in fact, to come from from the cassette buffer. L fill three eighty comma zero point sixty four. So we'll clear that out. Uh, so now we need a nice um, C sixty four sprite pointer. Sprite C sixty four. Sorry, mouse pointer sprite. Surely I can find one that someone's already made. Um, if not, actually what we should just do is in fact um, L copy uh, mouse pointer sprite to 380 and we want to copy 63 bytes. Here somewhere. Unsigned char sprite. Oops, mouse pointer. Mouse pointer sprite. 63 bytes. Oh, 
Okay, we'll just draw something really crusty for the moment. So we'll have eight pixels across. And let's. So eight pixels down. And then we want to have a diagonal line going through so that uh, needs to be C A. Let's see whether I've correctly drawn a sprite using hex. Um, that would be kind of cool if it's actually worked properly first time. Ah, look at that! That's recognisable as an arrow. We can even make the um, uh, the, the little arm on it longer. As you can see here, the the network is stuffing up. I don't know whether that's the um, uh, my Ethernet controller, the way I'm driving it in software, or whether it's the um, Ethernet over power adapter losing packets. But there's uh, something wonky going on. But um, that's right. Cause we'll if you run it again, it, it tends to fix it anyway. There we go. That'll get us a little bit more. leg on the arrow. There we go. That looks pretty good to me. Okay, so we've got a, um, uh, a sprite there for the uh, the mouse pointer. But of course, at the moment, if I move the mouse around, as you see, absolutely nothing is happening, or rather as, you, uh, as you're as not seeing. So let me then over here again now we have one of the, the nice things with the mega 65 is you don't have to muck about with the um, uh, the demultiplexing of the uh, the pots with the CIAs on d620 and d621 we simply have the pots on joystick port 1 they're just there and then joystick port 2 they're here so you've got all four pots available the whole time. This is a joy. Um, and you don't have to worry about then counting cycles and blah, 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 blah. So we can do the most disgusting mouse driver that you have ever seen. Um, if we just want to do a, a quick proof of concept that the mouse is working. We can simply poke the sprite X position and Y position with the values of those pots. So this won't handle the kind of the, the wrap around thing and all of that kind of funky stuff that the uh, the mouse needs to do. Um, crudely read the mouse. Oops. Scroll using keyboard. will hopefully get the mouse moving once the page is loaded. Look at that. So you can see, again, it's, it's doing funky stuff because the value that comes out of the, uh, the pot can be low. But you can see, so I'm moving the mouse from left to right. And indeed, it's going left to right if I move it. So vertical movement is inverted uh, at the moment, but that's easy enough for us to, uh, uh, to deal with. But we have connection to the mouse, um, which is what we wanted. So let's make a nice little function for that. Um, update mouse position.
So what we want to do, we need to maintain unsigned short mouse X, unsigned short mouse Y. I'm going to start it in the middle of the screen. We're just going to have, we can put these sprites into H640 and V40 resolution mode so that we have finer positioning. We don't really need to for this and it would be easy if we don't have to fiddle around with more significant bits. Um, unsigned char last D620. Unsigned char last D621. We need to know what the last value of those registers were as we go through. So we're going to also read those when we set up. Because otherwise when the mouse, when it first starts talking to the mouse, the mouse position is very unlikely to be zero in the way that it reports in 1351, because it reports a six bit relative position. Um, so it would mean that the mouse pointer will just jump somewhere seemingly random, right? Um, so we can uh, get initial mouse position. So now what we want to do is to add that on. And what we want, there's ambiguity because you only have six bits of resolution, right? So if it's only a bit more, then obviously we want to add it. If it's more than 32 more, um, then we want to take it away. Or if it's less than, uh, we want to, uh, to subtract it again. But we have to kind of do this clamping to see whether the number is should actually be a positive or a negative uh, value. So we kind of need to be able to work out a, a delta, right? Um, so delta equals peak OX D620 minus last D620. Uh, so we have char delta. If delta is less than zero, Delta is negative. If delta is greater than minus 32, then what we want to do is say mouse x. Uh, that, that it really is a, a movement left, because the value is reduced, it's reduced by less than 32. Uh, so we want to, uh, to go left. Um, otherwise, the difference is too much. We actually want the mouse to go right by 64 minus the delta. Um, because it's 
Actually, is that right? So if the we look at the two values, so the, the old value that we read from D620 and the new value. If the new value is less, sorry, if the, the delta, the difference between them is negative, we want to move left. If the difference is positive, we want to move right by that amount. But if the delta is really big, then we assume it's actually going the other way. Um, let's actually just, for the, we can actually just be really crude, we can actually just clamp it. And just say, well, actually, we're just not going to move the mouse. If the delta is moved by heaps, then at most we'll, we'll end up skipping uh, some position. And then we need to mouse X. We need to allow for the sprites here uh, they start from in the border so we need to kind of uh, adjust for that if mouse x plus 50 is greater than this is setting the, uh, the most significant bit X and mouse Y, right. Oh, because it... I'm going to a lot of effort for no good reason here. Because we are using um, the uh, CC65, uh, CC65 include I've already written functions to do this. Okay. So, but we, but we can, yes. I made my life easy, didn't I, at some point? Okay. Let's mouse. Get rid of all of that fluff. Okay, if we want to update the mouse position, actually first we did this last D uh, mouse warp to 160 comma 100 mouse update Gonna have to be a little bit creative here um, because we want to allow the mouse to move off the screen and when it does we're going to manually warp it back up and do the scroll setting the mouse up to so this update pointer I think from memory we can have a look at the, the source of this mouse update pointer okay right so that updates the pointer on the screen based on the current mouse position Okay, so mouse update position is what we want. We can feed it nulls if we don't care. Right. So if we do this update position, this will cancel out those any initial deltas, right? So the mouse appears in the the center so we do the initial update we warp it then we're binding it to a sprite because
interest then we can use mouse update pointer after we do uh, mouse update pointer. so then when in the main loop we'll actually call the update position and mouse update pointer and that will read the mouse position and it will um, update it. So update mouse position. We'll put our two calls in there. So we're not going to get all clever and put the bounding box on it yet. What have I got wrong here? Now call, oh yeah, we, if you want to use the mouse, we should include mouse.h. That's looking more promising. So in theory now, once the page is loaded, we should be able to move our mouse around. In theory. The mouse position, those first two bytes on the left of that have changed. So that is working. Uh, I, um, I might have bound it accidentally to the wrong sprite because I reckon it might need to be, yes, position sprite number is uh, starting from zero going to seven. to actually fully load before it gets to the code that controls the mouse. So you see here again it's kind of like it's dropping some packets and it's waiting for timeouts and retransmissions and things and it's just being quite lethargic. And then other times it's like super zippy. It's probably just faster in this case to to stop and restart it in fact. As I say it's quite random as to whether it does this or not. Funny jerkiness, so I'm using a, a bill as the uh, uh, the mouse mat, so it doesn't surprise me that it's being a bit jerky. And you can see there, there's you know we need to, to debounce the mouse value. So actually, we should actually improve the um, uh, the library function that handles the mouse. So I'm not that fussed about fixing it now, we'll fix it in the library and then it will be better for everything. Um, but you know it's for the time being this is this is fine, right? We can move the mouse around uh, and that will be right. Now the, the bounding box of course is um, wrong. So we can see that it's uh, ending before the right hand edge and the mouse can go off the edge. Oh, so this one's in connection. Oh. So, for, yes, we can go. There, we have a, a wraparound problem at the bottom. Again, we should 
fix the the library code for that. But let's have a look at setting the bounding box to something that is going to be better for us here. Mouse set bounding box. Yeah, so I think hopefully get us pretty close to being able to move around on the screen. By having the bounding box non-zero uh, on the left edges, that might also fix that wraparound problem in practice as well. Radio Parallax still playing? It looks like it might have stopped. I don't, I don't get fold back on the audio, so I can't tell. Um, we've got this network problem again. Hey, 6502 Kebab. Welcome along. go perfectly to the top and we can't scroll off that's good and I can scroll down to the bottom and it really only goes to the edge so that's good oh, and of course I've made the yeah the, the left edge of the X is fine but of course it I should have added 320 um, yes, we completely agree, 6502 Kebab, that it is a, uh, <laughs> a great machine. It's great fun to, uh, to develop on and, uh, and do this kind of crazy stuff as well. So, there's... Right. So the X should be 320 plus 23. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to allow the Y position... to go somewhat off the screen in both directions. The reason being is that when we detect that, that will actually tell us by how much we should be scrolling uh, up or down. And then we'll just warp the, the mouse back onto the, um, uh, to the edge of the screen. So uh, we can see we can go off the, the top a bit now. Yeah, we can go all the way up. Actually, let's check that right edge. Yep, so we can go right to the right edge, right to the left edge. And likewise, we can go off the bottom a bit uh, as well. So, this is good. So now let's try and tie that in. So when we get the, because this will let us read back the mouse position, won't it? So let's have a look at our update the mouse position. Right, unsigned short MX and Y. of those. Okay. So, if MY is less than 50, oops, mouse is in top 
folder. So scroll up by that amount. Scroll down by minus. Of course, it's going to be by. So it's a negative number that we want to scroll down by. And the amount we want to scroll down by is 50 minus MY. Uh, mouse warp 2, MX 50. So we scroll by that amount and we move the mouse to be exactly on the top edge. And then we'll do much the same. The mouse is in the bottom border. Right. So we should now have scrolling plumbed in on the mouse. Now, of course, we haven't done the smooth scrolling yet, as I said. Um, that actually shouldn't be very hard for us to do. Ooh! <laughs> right. Um, let's load that again and try and scroll down first instead of up. Because clearly we've got something a touch wonky there. Yeah, so this is, again, it's doing something funny with the network. Um, WeRP has been a great starting point for the TCP engine for the Mega 65, um, but we have found that we've had to fix a whole pile of things. You know, whether that's just because I botched things up in the port or not, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we are fluffing up the scroll behind there. What's it setting it to? Yeah, it's like massively moving out. That's weird because again, we've got that code to clamp where it goes to, right? Um, oh, well, in that direction. Fix this up absolutely. So when we were in that direction, we had it. The the logic was completely balked. So we might we'll just try that again. Scrolling off the bottom edge of the screen. So each of those dots represents a packet being received. You can see that you kind of you get these patches where it's seconds between packets and then a whole burst of them will come through. There's something funny in the, uh, the, the TCP uh, retransmission timers, I think. Um, and again, like it'll be faster for us to just restart that and it'll then probably go through quite quickly. Yeah. Anyway. Now what is it? Oh, 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 oh. And so we can still the key this is what I'm now pressing the keys, right? To do keyboard scrolling. So we know that, that will all work. 
Fuck. And it's trying to scroll, but when you go up, is clearly broken. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it's setting it again to that same funny address. Wonder why that is. So making it a nice mouse pointer would be um, a, a nice improvement to it. Well, and so that I actually I drew that pointer. That's what I actually drew in the hexadecimal, right? Um, if we come back over to the um, that's what this hex here is actually the uh, the bitmap for the sprite right so the first byte is ff so that's eight bits set to a one that's the eight set pixels across on the uh, the arrow uh, and the rest of it uh, is down through here so hmm. so let's scroll down so we know that doing deltas of eight So let's just be cheeky. I'm just going to tell it to instead of scrolling down proportional to the um, amount that the mouse was moved, we will just scroll exactly one line of text every time it happens. So this should stop the glitching. Because basically just using the mouse's um, de facto cursor keys, which is really stupid, but it should work. Yeah, so now it doesn't glitch when you go up the top. And we still have that problem with the um, some of the text being black for whatever reason. It's a bit weird. Um, you can actually already see like it's kind of it's much nicer to actually just scroll with it this way. So again, we are now scrolling well off the bottom, which it, ooh, there's all sorts of funky stuff down here. <laughs> oh, and there's um, that region. No, I'm actually almost half inclined to say we actually don't need to worry about doing the smooth scrolling um, because then you're never losing anything on a, uh, a half line but you can still just tick down with the mouse a line at a time if you want to or you can do uh, you know really quite rapid movements and so it's just how long you're moving it is actually how much it scrolls um, rather than how much that's probably fine. Again, it's weird with this black. Suspecting that might be another funny thing with the, um, the TCP stack because you can actually see. I reckon there's it's missed some data here because it should have been a thing that looks like this. It's kind of cool having the mouse pointer to be able to show as well. Um, but it doesn't here so I'm going to load it again and see if it still looks the same um, so I think we have seen variation in what actually gets loaded so I reckon there's this is still more bugs in um, uh, in WeIP or our port of WeIP I don't want to blame the uh, developers of uh, WeIP when it's just as likely my own stupid fault somewhere Yeah, see, that's how it should look. That's all fine because it's all lined up. 
yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a, a, a packety problem in there. But so I reckon we must be calculating the maximum offset address incorrectly because it shouldn't be letting us scroll all the way down into this rubbish. It should be, you know, only going down as far as there, the end of the page. So let's have a look at that logic for that again. Uh, would it be possible to use the scroll wheel for scrolling? Um, maybe um, again with the uh, the mouse it is possible to uh, to configure the mouse wheel to trigger various things and you can actually tell it to do like joystick up and down for example um, so that would be uh, a way that should work uh, for this um, Answer to your oops uh, question, Anton. Again, so the uh, uh, the mouse pointer I just um, oops true um, in the hex in the mouse pointer sprite array. If it happens to look like something else, it's pure coincidence. Um, it's just me really quickly crappily making a, uh, a pointer. Okay, so let's let work out that. So if line count is more than 50, screen line offset max is equal to... Hundred and sixty bytes, so it's eighty times two for each line we have more than fifty. I'm just gonna do a bit of debug here. I'm gonna write out the line count value. So we're already writing out to E triple zero the um, the screen offset max, which we can actually have a quick look at since it's already loaded. Yeah, see that max is still way too high. Um, there's something quite quite fishy going on there, um, and I reckon that might be that we processing the line count wrong. So now we're going to read the, the line count in uh, as well. Or rather we're going to display it there and that will give us that clue. So it could be that I have the, uh, the MSB and the LSB or something switched around, right? Okay. Still got the funny value for that. Yeah, so it reckons the line count is so zero one in the high byte, so it's more than two hundred and fifty six lines. It's, it's a, quite a, a few lines, about nearly four hundred, which is it's not nearly four hundred. Um, Is, okay, we do have 0, 1, and 99 in the file, so it's offset 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so offset's 10 and 11. Hard coded as the x, um, the maximum number of lines, rather than 
using the number of lives that we actually consumed. So we can just do this. We don't even need a plus one, right? It's just Y is the maximum line that we used. Imagine that calculation was wrong anyway, because it should have been divided by 160, not by uh, 80. So let's rebuild it, reload it. those values yes yeah, so now the maximum line is much much less and yes our maximum screen offset is suitably low so hopefully yes okay clearly we should be clearing some memory out that we're not um, scroll wheel to work right that's going to feel really nice to just be able to uh, tick through the, um, the text that way but that's already feeling actually really nice uh, we've got yeah a bunch of bugs and things to track down if anyone's interested in pitching in and having a look at the VIP code and everything and seeing if we can figure out where those um, funny network things are happening um, that would be absolutely welcome uh, but otherwise, I reckon, again, even in the meantime, I will probably have a look at adding support for the hyperlinks uh, so that we can actually have multiple pages that are linked to one another and uh, and load them up uh, in turn, which will be really, really cool. But it's uh, almost one o'clock in the morning here now, so I'm going to uh, wind it up, I think, and um, we'll catch us all next time. So, yeah, have a great day great evening keep safe and uh, yeah we'll see you next time see you